Hi, and welcome to All Things Cozy with Matt and Julian. We are a bi-weekly podcast about everything that is warm, soft, and comforting. What's cozier than finding nourishment in nature itself? This week, Julian and I went on a foraging adventure where we nibbled on edible plants in the wilds of Los Angeles. We'll share what we learned about safely foraging in urban areas, but before we venture into the wild forest snack, let's check in with what's cozy in the news. Jillian, what is on your desk this week? Well, I spotted this story from our cozy friend, Tina Kay, who shared it on Instagram, and it really stole my heart. As the New York Times reported, a library in Worcester, Mass., is offering a perfect idea for eliminating its patrons' fees for lost or damaged books, March Meowness. And here's how March Meowness works. Folks submit any image of a cat, whether it's a photo of their own for a baby or cat art, to have their fees forgiven. So as long as the item features a cat, you have successfully paid the cat toll. So it's going to be a magazine clipping. It could be a poster, whatever it is. We picture a friend's cat. But it's amazing, no matter what the image of the cat is, because not only will patrons with fees be able to use their library cards again, because let's be honest, if you haven't given a book back in a long time, the fees they do rack up. It's also inspiring the turn of many missing books. So many great things from this initiative, but it only lasts for the month of March. And they're also doing a wonderful March event within the cat theme. So for example, you can DIY cat toys, a cat eye makeup tutorial. So all at the main library in Worcester, you can partake in these wonderful cat activities. I should have said cat-tivities. <laughs> Made another pun. But I just think it's a wonderful idea. I myself have had a library fee even show up on my credit report. It was my proudest moment I had moved. And these things happen. Sometimes you forget about a book and they get lost within a move. And I didn't even realize I had this book out until I saw it on my credit report. So maybe- Wow. They- yeah. They're coming for you. Just show the collections agents a photo of a cat. And that will get them off your back, Julian. Right. I was going to say, can we go to Credit Karma and have Mark <laughs> be honest? But I did get it removed and I, I did find the book. So I think it's wonderful. All these books are coming back. And then also within this cat context, which is wonderful because cats are awesome. And when you combine cats and books, what could go wrong? I love the tagline for this. The felines for fee forgiveness is so cute. And I know, Julian, that if this were the a broad policy, you would never have that situation happen again because you have cat photos for many lifetimes. You could just completely own all the library books with your cat photos. Yeah, I could send it to the town of Worcester and <laughs> resolve everything. But I also forgot to say or forgot to say is that the, the Worcester Facebook library page is sharing all of the cat tributes. So the wall of cat love is getting bigger and bigger by the minute. So um, head over onto their Facebook page to see that all in action. That sounds perfect. (laughs) What's on your cozy (laughs) news desk? Well, we're going to talk a lot today about how to identify plants that are safe to eat. But what if something you thought was a plant was actually a turtle? Popular science reports that a fossil specimen has been reclassified from being a plant to being a baby turtle, and thus earning the moniker of a grass-type Pokemon, Turtwig, which is half plant, half turtle. Of course you know Turtwig. I know, Jillian, you're a huge oh, Pokemon yeah. fanatic. Got a tattoo. <laughs> so apparently, Colombian priest Padre Huertas originally discovered and classified the fossil specimen, but what he thought were leaves and stems is actually the rib bones and vertebrae of a turtle shell. Fabiani Herrera, a paleobotanist, just like Laura Dern in Jurassic Park, who is also the assistant curator at the Field Museum in Chicago, is the one who took a closer look at this fossil and started the process of reclassifying it. And of course, since scientists are nerds, they immediately associated the find with Pokemon. So this it's an intersectional cozy in the news segment. Not only are we scientifically cozy, but we are pop culture cozy. I just want to say Turtwig for the rest of my life. <laughs> like the Grateful Dead. Like, what do they call those dead heads? I don't know what they are. And I want to be a Turtwig head. I'm with you. It's a very cute name. It's a cute Pokemon. And honestly, even the evolution of Turtwig still is in line with this kind of fossil. We're, we're, we're always half turtle, half plant. Very cute and on brand. Turtwig, we choose you. What we also chose to do is the main topic for our episode. 
this kind of goes into like listeners have really brought us into the know around things like cottage core, which we really never knew about until you all clued us in. And we have been thinking about this topic of like foraging sounds like a really cozy thing, but like neither Jillian nor myself are the types who really I wouldn't trust us in a survival situation with picking out the food. What do you think, Jillian? Am I wrong to say that? I think you're absolutely right to say that. And there's the first lesson we learned I would have done, which is the biggest no-no. We're going to get into that. (laughs) But even to be honest, getting out on the hike, I was nervous about because the way it was presented was you're going all over this park and it's going to be a big hike. And so can I even make it while I be left down the hill? Will Matt abandon me? And We're here though. We survived it. We survived it. We have a lot of lessons to bring to you today because knowing our limitations, we sought the guidance from experts. This was a guided tour. We're going to go into the details of our foraging trip specifically. But first, let's talk a little bit about foraging in general. It's really no wonder why foraging has grown increasingly popular. It promotes sustainability. It can improve food security in times that have been quite uncertain. And it reconnects people to nature when we've never been more tethered to technology. But what might feel like a trend today is really as old as humankind itself. Foraging is an instinctual practice. Since the beginning, humans have scoured their surroundings to survive, gathering berries, nuts, and roots to satisfy their hunger. It's true that now we door dash instead of rock smash, but going back to basics can satisfy the soul as well as our survival instinct. It's cozy to know that you can find safety and sustenance for yourself. So where does the modern forager roam? Anywhere there's nature. From lush forests to urban parks, the bounty of the land beckons to those with a keen eye and an adventurous spirit. Whether it's hunting for wild mushrooms hidden beneath fallen leaves or plucking succulent berries from tangled brambles, foragers can find flavor in any corner of the world. So get your baskets ready as we venture into the heart of the wilderness, a.k.a. Elysian Park in Los Angeles, California, where more leaves, stems, and petals than you can imagine are ready to tickle your taste buds. Our foraging trip, again, we knew nothing about it, so we looked to the professionals for guidance and signed up for a workshop on edible, specifically in this case, invasive plants growing in Elysian Park. We were led by Jason Wise, also known as Jason Journeyman on Instagram, at Jason Journeyman, who is a certified California naturalist, professional outdoor environmental educator, and prolific tree hugger. And this workshop involved a couple dozen plant-curious people meeting in the park and taking a relaxed hike. So with Jason's guidance, we practiced plant identification skills to know what you can eat and what you can't eat, gathered various invasive edible plants, and at the end, put them all together to enjoy a foraged salad. Let's first start off with some of the basic tips we learned. So going off of what Jillian mentioned is we learned some things that Maybe it would have killed us initially before we took this trip. Jillian, what did we learn first and foremost about how one should safely approach foraging? Well, don't eat plants in your pathways because you might be eating piss. Can I say piss? <laughs> That's a big one. Yeah. Especially especially in an urban environment. I mean, people are walking their dogs all over the place. There's just probably lots of doo-doo bacteria and PP all over these plants. We don't really want to eat them. And I would have feasted on it because it's the closest (laughs) thing to the past. So the easiest thing to get and what you're most (laughs) gravitated toward, I I think, because your eyes spot it first, it's on the ground. You're also, when you walk, sometimes you look toward your feet and then you see it and you think, oh, I'll grab this, but you don't consider all the animals that are hopping on through and going a little tinkle of what you might be eating. I also want to share quickly that we did find this on Eventbrite. And I want to shout out Eventbrite because Eventbrite has so many cool activities like this that are in your in your city. And it's not just for your friend posting about their their show or something. <laughs> uh, for an acquaintance, you don't want to go to their event. It's actually for wonderful, wonderful things. And that's how we found this this class. So well, check now we're having flashbacks and shame to the Eventbrites that I've created. I don't think you ever invited me to an Eventbrite thing. So I think I'm no, fine this, these were in this... like professional capacities, but okay. still. Sorry. Leaving the potty talk in the past. I know Jillian doesn't like talking about that stuff, but even the land itself, like the quality of the soil is important. So don't eat off of abandoned lots. Anything that seems like abandoned, you don't know what was there. It could be that that plot was abandoned because of contamination in the soil. Maybe there was a gas station that used to be there that was knocked down. We don't, you don't know the history of that plot. So if it looks like it's just been completely derelict, don't munch on anything there because no. you don't know. And unless you want to become like radioactive man, try to avoid that. 
One more note on your terrain, especially in an urban environment, a lot of manicured lawns are around. Don't eat plants on or near manicured lawns, again, because of the pesticides that those people may be using on their landscaping. It's just better to avoid it. I was also thinking that the lawn's manicured. It probably belongs to someone. I'm imagining me strolling up to someone's lawn just chomping away. Is there a woman grazing in my lawn? <laughs> right. I could see myself on, what's that, next door? Exactly. <laughs> I get tranquilized by someone. God knows. This woman's eating all my flowers. Uh, um, multiple <laughs> reasons to stay away from the manicured lawn. Yeah, exactly. If you, that's someone's property, probably. Don't do that. And also, like, this is something that we didn't know, so we ended up going with a, a host. But it is important to, if you're alone, to know your poisons very well. If you don't have an expert like we had with Jason, come prepared with a book or guide. And just in general, be cautious with what you're eating. One thing, too, that Jason had provided for us were these breathable bags as well, so that the the finds, our wonderful finds that we foraged, wouldn't wilt. Although the, the netting was funny because everything we found was so tiny. It's <laughs> falling it was, through. It's just falling through. So maybe find like a, a a closer open netting, like like the little toy bag that Jillian recommended for Easter. Maybe something more like that. <laughs> yeah. Jillian, did you get did you get your toy bag yet? I did. So did? I will have to model it. If you're not familiar, I spotted or one of my tips was for an Easter find shop in the children's section of expensive department stores. You could you could find is some it, good is things. Is it is it a, how big is it? Did it end up being the size you were hoping? It's pretty tiny, but most clutches are. Yeah. So <laughs> I'll have to I'll have to find a moment when I yeah we'll, we'll do a, we'll do a, a runway and then finally if you're foraging a native plant take only what you need and give back by distributing seeds a little bit more of like you know restorative for all the munching you're doing out in the wild. All right, so when it came to eat the weeds, as the title of our workshop advertised, we we approach different types of plants that are edible that are also invasive. And kind of the long-term goal of all of this snacking on invasive plants is that we remove them from the environment and give more space for native plants to thrive. Jillian, take us through the first thing we found and what you thought about the flavor profile of that plant. My favorite plant, just for its name, the cheeseweed mallow. Or I like to call it some cheese whiz. We saw that <laughs> all over wherever we went. I think it's probably the most common plant. And it's the first one that we we tasted. What I remember, it had more of a a spicy profile. Am I remembering it correctly? The leaves did have a little bit of spice to them, especially because one issue with foraging is bolting, where like the flower continues to grow and that can create bitterness in the leaf. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So I think some of the leaves that we were eating were just a little bitter. And so I think that kind of gave it like more of a spicy flavor as well. And what's really interesting is these have little like fruits in them that they get their name because these little fruits that they have and like it looks like they were like in the stem basically mm -hmm. look like cheese wheels yes very cute and, and those are very, very cute and edible like you could take them out and be little little miniature cheese wheels so i learned a lot i had no idea about that and of course it's a mallow so you will recognize that word from marshmallows so the roots are made to make marshmallows yeah. so a lot you can gather from that plant mm -hmm. although of course like making the mallow into a marshmallow it takes a lot more labor once you actually get the root and everything and he gave another great tip that might seem common sense but when we're foraging we're just so excited and we're grabbing things if it has some holes in it don't take it search yeah. for well, the full green leaf and i think he also said that those little cheese wheels can go in salads just to give a lot more texture to a salad he said i think he pickles them and in puts them into like makes them into capers basically mallow root he's never tried that but that is a very extensive process to do it but it can be done yes we'll leave that to the professionals yes the second plant that we nibbled on and one of my favorites was black mustard so these are yellow flowers and they had these little black seeds and they've got a kick to them you really taste the mustard when you're munching on them and i really liked that little spicy kick what did you think of the mustard plant it was way too spicy for me and I correct myself, this is the first plant that we found. So it is, yeah. I thought that was a great opener because it had the most kick. Yeah. And it is a great showstopper for the foraging plant walk. It was extremely spicy to me, but some other folks really loved it and they're just popping in their mouths left and mm -hmm. right. <laughs> this is a perfect one, obviously, for a salad if you want to give it a little kick. But yeah, I, I wasn't a fan. I think if I had me put it on something and not just ate it straight, then mm -hmm. it would be a little different. What I also loved about Jason's tour is he sprinkled stopping and eating the plants with 
some stories about how these invasive plants got to be in California. So these mustard plants, from what we were told, were brought over by the Spanish and were used when they were building all the missions in California. And a lot of the trails that they would make between the missions would get not used frequently and they would get grown over. And so what they would do as they travel is to kind of sprinkle these mustard seeds along the pathway. So even if the growth happened, you could tell where the path was supposed to be by the streaks of yellow. They do create like a really pretty yellow flower, but they don't belong here. (laughs) And so we will eat them out of existence in California. Yes. The next one was my favorite one. Sour grass, wood sorrel. And it's often confused with clover, a yellow bell flowers with a lemon leaf flavor. And so I thought the flavor here was so refreshing. And one of the things that Jason said was that you could make it into simple syrups, which is wonderful because as that, like I said, that bright lemony flavor. So that's something I definitely want to try. If I had to try any of these to take take home with me, it'd be the sour grass. I could just eat the sour grass as is and I'd make it into simple syrup. And Matt, I think you also really enjoyed this one too. Yeah, this was by far my favorite. It was a shockingly refreshing lemon flavor. And this is the kind of thing you could eat like everything about it. The flower tasted good. The leaves tasted good. The stems tasted good. This is a great all around snack. And I'm so glad I can identify it because this is something I actually probably would if I see it again. I would go out of my way to eat more. (laughs) Yeah, everyone loved it. People were grabbing and you had to kind of push your way around some foods to get some good stocks. Yeah, but even the stocks, like you said, you could eat it down to the... The last nub, and it was it, great. It's just you're not expecting such a like crisp lemon flavor out of just like something that just looks almost like, oh, it's like kind of a, like a little flower or whatever, but you're not expecting that amount of flavor in that. Honestly, going into this, I thought everything was just going to taste like grassy or something. Be technically edible, but not have any flavor. And I was very wrong about that, especially in this case. Yeah, and this is the easiest one to collect and and use, in my opinion, if you're nervous about incorporating these into meals, I think this would be the easiest one. I, d- I would just put it on top of some some fish or <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, no, Call for sure. A day. We also, so this was actually brought over again, by, I believe, by the Spanish to feed chickens, which is what's called chickweed. Makes sense. And it's like a delicate little flowers, little white flowers on a green plant. And chickweed didn't have any flavor, really, that I could discern. I remember like being like, it was fine. It didn't taste bad, but it didn't. It was very just grassy. This is this is kind of what I thought everything was going to taste like. It was just kind of whatever. Yeah, same here. It was fine. I felt like a little chicken eating exactly. it. It's no wonder <laughs> they, they are happy to have the chickens eat it. It's not like human beings are going to really want to incorporate this into a lot of meals. But if I was stranded in Elysian Park, I had nothing to eat. <laughs> I'd be eating the chickweed. <laughs> well, the next one is pretty fun. It's Christmas themed. It's the California holly or the Christmas berry. Or the Toyon berry. So the California holly, Jason shared a fun story, was that they had to pass a law back in the day because folks would be chopping off the the holly to use for their Christmas decorations, which is is, is pretty funny. And you imagine the holly standing out amongst all the palm trees and it was probably ir- irresistible to the folks who love Christmas. So uh, that was an interesting factoid that Jason shared. This little red round tiny little berry it tastes like a very small apple but a very mealy apple and i know this just because it rained a lot and me that was played a role it wasn't very tart but perhaps that we we didn't eat the right one the more bright it is i would imagine the more tart it is it just tasted like a very miniature apple that i was half and half on i know matt you didn't like it Yeah, I I didn't love it. And honestly, that's fine because this is a native plant and we don't want Matt eating all the berries so it'll stop reproducing. So I I, I did think about it, though, like I really would love to grab some of these for Christmas. They would be such a, a, you know, natural decoration for the holidays, even though that is forbidden. You go to jail. But this is actually the official native plant of California. I guess there you go. (laughs) I wonder where the holly comes from. The holly is the Hollywood. Who knows? (laughs) <laughs> so those were the plants that we had our personal experience foraging with. And as you can see, it was a range. They were all edible and they all could come together into a salad. Now, we did not partake in the forage salad at the end. We decided it was our time to go. But I thought that was a very sweet way to wrap up. And it, it gave a chance for all the people to kind of commune together and hang out at the end. And especially if you're if you're going on 
these sorts of trips to make friends is a good opportunity to make conversation and make connections with other people. Yeah, it was nice how everyone came together and took out their finds because we weren't sure if we were going to eat a prepared salad that Jason had or if we we're going to pull together all of our collections along the way. And it turns out it was mostly our collections, but par partially Jason had a base for it. And then they just, the folks added in everything that they found, which it made it also very special. It was a communal effort. Absolutely. And then there's also a takeaway, which is a recipe guide uh, that we were given. And that kind of goes over some of the stuff we were discussed about blanching the greens to make them more palatable and generally more information about each of these edible plants and how you might incorporate them into recipes. In general, like my favorite overall takeaways from the experience, I really just love Jason's enthusiasm for the natural environment, for preserving native plants, and for educating other people in that. And he had a really funny way of sharing plant rumors. And he would preface it by being like, I don't know if these are 100% true, but these are rumors that are about plants that we have. And so that's how we got some of the information about the, the toyon berries and how mustard got into California, things like that. All the plant rumors are really fun. One other thing, too, is in terms of like the community that was built as we were on this foraging trip together, early on, we were asked to find someone else that we didn't come with, which of course, like for Julian and I immediately caused like spikes of anxiety, but we were also are very good at participating. I thought Julian and I would stay together and meet other people. But as soon as he said that, all of a sudden Julian just bolts off and leaves me in the dust and she starts to go talk to other people. And <laughs> I took it very seriously because I didn't hmm. want them to think that I was not following the instructions. But I, was, I also got nervous in that moment because I was looking around and you were close nearby other people. I was kind of like, I looked to my right, no one's there. And everyone was already in kind of groups. So I was like, oh God, I'm going to be standing alone. And I kind of was. <laughs> so I had I had to dart off to the other side of the, the park. Like I started talking to this guy that we were next to and then I turned to Jillian about to introduce her to him. And then there she goes. She's all the way half across the park. But, but honestly, you know, it, what's great about that is that we did get to meet more people as a result of that. And it was very nice. But we had to share our favorite vegetables. That was kind of our icebreaker question. And the absolute commotion that was caused by zucchini is a berry, technically, like that factoid really caused a stir in this group. And I, th I thought that that was so adorable. We were all impressed by that fact. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was very fun. It was such a smart opener. And it wasn't awkward and we got to learn a lot of new things. And also it's interesting what it reveals about one's personality through their favorite vegetable. Yeah. Mine's cucumber. I like to keep things pretty simple. I'm an easy woman with my food, so I can just throw that in some rice. I like my cucumbers. They're cool, crunchy, easy, can't go wrong, put them on anything. I, I completely second that. I wish I had thought of that because cucumbers are legitimately one of my favorite vegetables. I kind of freeze in these environments and I end up coming up with something that is not true, but is this the first thought that comes to mind? And I said beets. Yes. And I, I do like beets, but you know, they're they're really specific in terms of their kind of dirt flavor. So <laughs> <laughs> And when he told the couple that we were with, they even had a reaction like, Oh, beets, you know. Yeah, they were it's, like, it's... Okay, you're trying to be different, I guess. <laughs> No, but they were from the South and they that became a conversation about yeah. their favorite foods. And wasn't it, don't you dye deviled eggs with beets or my mystery? No, we we did that. I okay. think for, I want to say for a, a Valentine's Day where like I dyed the, yes, um, I remember. the deviled eggs pink and with, it, beet, with beet juice. And you shared that with them and it opened up a whole wonderful conversation about their love of deviled eggs and how yeah. it spans across the Midwest to Georgia, where they're from. So, I mean, there's so many conversations to be had from your favorite vegetables, so maybe use that as your next icebreaker. Yeah, I really enjoyed this. Hats off to Jason for creating a really informative and fun tour. I learned a lot. It felt very like warm and inclusive, and I feel like now I have a little bit more of like a steadier footing on what foraging is, how to approach that, especially in an urban environment. I know for sure if I ever see those lemongrass again, I will absolutely be, or sourgrass, I will definitely be eating it because it was so tasty. Yeah, I second those thoughts. Not only did I love and appreciate the same thing that you did about Jason, but also the people that we were with. It was so wonderful to see them get genuinely amped up as if, you know, the cheese mallow was the Beatles or something. And they were 
taking out their phones and jumping literally into the to the plants and getting all these different angles. I was one of them. Suddenly I became a plant photo taker. And I'm sure these photos months from now, it's like you have a night out and you wake up, you look at your photos and you're like, where did this come from? Or, Just blurry photos of right, leaves. Right. And so that's good. These are what these photos are going to be for me. I could maybe share the photos to the group, but yeah, I became that person too, because it was so fun, the energy of it. Everyone was trying to snap a pic and getting so amped and thrilled about it. So that was really fun to see. And also just getting outside and learning. So I don't think yeah. that we we do that enough. I mean, we talked about before how wonderful it is to learn new information through a cutting class that we took. Mm -hmm. And so this combined the best of both worlds, an educational tour, but also some exercise and breathing fresh air. And then we took a group picture at the end. I thought was really sweet. All in all, really good. Yes, absolutely. And again, do check out Jason Journeyman. I'll include his social media information in our show notes. If you're in the LA area or visiting a great, if there is an event that he's hosting, really do recommend that we had a, a good time. But also, I know a lot of our listeners are really into the concept of foraging. They're foragers themselves. I imagine other when other people forage, they're like going after mushrooms and they like they That's have really I imagine too. You know, like you know, meteor stuff. But I, you know, I think I think I broadened my mind when it came to foraging as a result of this trip. And I want to hear from you, listeners. If you're an experienced forager, let us know what you know about foraging by going into our Facebook group and leaving a post, or by commenting on our post about this foraging episode at All Things Cozy podcast on Instagram. Yeah. On the topic of foraging, I have a very foraging specific candle for us to review today. And I've been holding on to this for months. It was a gift, very thoughtful, it was a wonderful Christmas present. And it's by a company called East Fork, which does like really beautiful pottery. And so even just the candle holder is this, this really lovely pottery in of itself. They have all these really natural scents. This one is called Forage Moon. So it's it's the candle. Everything they make is the candle. It's the candle and Forage Moon by East Fork. And what makes this gift extra special was that, again, this was a luxury. It was way far out the price range of what I would normally buy myself. And I'm really grateful um, and appreciative of the gift because this is $32 for the small. Wow. We're talking votive size. So, you know, you, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's on the pricier side, but... Here is the scent profile for the Forge Moon. It's a blend of Hinoki, mushroom, dirt, and firewood. And I, I think Hinoki being a type of cypress in Japan. So that's it. you can tell it's a very like specific and kind of quirky scent profile. And they describe it as a fragrant soy candle in a reusable black mountain vessel. That's the pottery I mentioned that evokes storm clouds over an Appalachian ridge. The the thing that hits you right away from this scent is that immediately you're like, it's going to rain. It has okay. that that wet soil scent. It's very like irony. It's mineral. I love it. it is, this is exactly my kind of thing. I love like very natural scents. This is the kind of thing that can, it, it it's not a cloying, fake, phony scent. It is really natural. And I truly feel like I am recording this episode from inside. Like it's like someone buried me alive, and I'm just in the dirt. <laughs> oh. Yes, and, and that's I, what we all aspire to be: <laughs> smelling our candles from below the dirt. But it um, is amazing. It's like just how much it transports into that natural scent. I would give this an enthusiastic wick up. Like it is a unique experience. It's completely authentic smelling. And when it comes to like foraging in the forest and you're like digging for mushrooms, this is exactly what it would smell like. So I think it's achieving exactly what it's setting out to do. Well, I love the name for it, Forage Moon, and mm -hmm. the description, a moody candle for late nights and long baths. And I could imagine, you know, I'm freshly divorced. I'm on a, re <laughs> I'm on a retreat, maybe up in the woods of Vermont or Eastern Oregon or somewhere. And I am, yeah, taking a bath or opening up some earthy wine and I am you know, putting on some music. I have to light the candle in Forage Moon and I'm a new woman. Yes. It sounds so lovely. I'm jealous that you have it. I want it for myself. I think it's probably the most unique candle we've ever described outside of our goofy ones like pencil mm -hmm. shavings and cereal or whatever we've done. <laughs> really special. And also the look of the candle too. It has 
it's a black holder but mm-hmm. the rim of it is a light brown and it does remind me of that moon you know a blackout kind of thing and then yeah. the center of the ring has that white wax and a nice brown sur- ridge enclosing it and i thought that's really neat too and purposeful like everything about this candle seems so purposeful yeah it, it's really well crafted if you are looking to treat yourself and you like those kind of woody natural scents that make you feel that you're in nature highly recommend the candle and forge moon by east fork and the link to that is in our show notes lovely so in this spot or even actually before we would have gotten to the candle review we normally have our soothing sounds segment our show has always benefited from change and like switching things up and we decided to retire soothing sounds as much as we love to cozy out we're trying something new yeah so we're trying something new in the spot and we wanted a segment that really allowed us to talk about more cozy things like really warm vibes and we're hoping that this might be an avenue for that just one last little cozy tidbit for the road for you as we sign out so that's a big preamble but I, we just wanted to acclimate you and introduce you to our new segment which we're calling words of warmth <laughs> I think it's going to be a wonderful way to sign off to all of you because we do end on our show shout outs and that's always fun and pleasant. But this is something to, as they love to say in the workplace environments, marinate on. Something to <laughs> to think about and to hold hold on to the coziness, these words as you go about your week or your day or whatever, and to bring you joy and as this as the title of the segment is, some warmth. My words of warmth this week come from the Roman philosopher Cicero. And I apologize in advance. This is a dense one. So when we come to the segment, like I was excited because like I had just saved this quote because it really captures something I've been striving to do, which is to be a little less emotionally driven. Jillian can know I can fail at this at times. Oh, stop. But trying to create a balance. And I think a lot of folks have been reading more about the Stoics and you know, especially in an era where we have a lot of things thrown at us, like how do we balance our emotions and stay happy when there's so much stuff that we're supposed to want or need or have achieved and things that can kind of unsettle us. And I, and I hope this quote can provide you some food for thought as it did for me. So here's the quote. Therefore, the man, whoever he is, whose soul is tranquilized by restraint and consistency and who is at peace with himself so that he neither pines away in distress nor is broken down by fear, nor consumed with a thirst of longing in pursuit of some ambition, nor maudlin in the exuberance of meaningless eagerness. He is the wise man of whom we are in quest. He is the happy man who can think no human occurrence insupportable to the point of dispiriting him or unduly delightful to the point of rousing him to ecstasy. And that was from the Tusculan Disputations, if you're looking for some light reading for your bedtime. <laughs> but I really, I really love this concept. It made me really think about, like, how do you define happiness? Like, and I really like this view of happiness as happiness as being a person who can stay calm, can stay cool and collected. Those big moments, they don't rock you. You are, you are so satisfied and comfortable in yourself that things that go wrong, they don't throw you off course. And things that like are really stimulated and exciting, they don't um, pull you into being, you know, big headed or give you a, a weird sense of reality. And I, I just kind of staying that course that feels very cozy to me, and that's why I wanted to share this quote. Yeah, I think it's cozy, especially for the concept of finding that inner peace, and that's always such a elusive feeling, especially in our our world that we all exist in. It's it's so hard to find that. Yeah, just the quietness and that and peace and confidence and. In, in being oneself. So I it is it is weighty, but I like it. And I think that this person was very big on meditation. Because <laughs> I think it's a very good meditative quote to really think about. And the more you think about it, the more that is revealed. So, I promise my future words of warmth will not be so dense. It just happened to be that this is what I had ready to go. <laughs> well, this is the, I think that's the beauty of this segment is that it's whatever is moving us, whatever words of warmth is, happens to be moving us right now that we share. And I think that goes into something that is important too is that it could be something as simple as a phrase or matt joked earlier it could be a sign at a marshall's <laughs> it, it could really be anything a lyric and i that's really wonderful because we're so focused on the things that we're reading of our book club and that's all great but these 
snippets, these brief fleeting messages yeah. that could really bring us some comfort and, and warmth. So I think that's what's so special about you too. This is something I never would have on my own come up with because I was like, try to take me a few times to read it and get and get to understand because the fact that you even like oh, this is a quote for me is it's a testament to your intelligence. So I think that's also going to be really revealing about each other. Or no, 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 no. Th again, this is this is this happened to be something that in my reading I stumbled across. It's not some. This is not where I am living every day. <laughs> <laughs> like you can pretend just for um, listeners he yeah, lives here no. but julian <laughs> i want to hear what your words of warmth are okay so my words of warmth come from leslie jameson and the essay collection the empathy exams and this is a really interesting essay collection if you want to dive into it because leslie worked as a paid medical actor and what that means is she would act out symptoms for medical students to diagnose and through that it really made her Think about em empathy and what that really means and what, it, and what it looks like. So one of her quotes on empathy, I think, is really poignant. She says, empathy isn't just listening. It's asking the questions whose answers need to be listened to. Empathy requires inquiry as much as imagination. Empathy requires knowing you know nothing. Empathy means acknowledging a horizon of context that extends perpetually beyond what you can see. And I love the phrase horizon of context because when I envision it in my head, I see all these lives that people are living and the, the days that we don't get to see and the, the hard moments that we don't, that are beyond our periphery. And so I thought it's a beautiful way to say it. And I also like the phrase empathy requires knowing you know nothing because oftentimes, and I think it's just so common, we have, we can assume we know whether people are thinking and, and feeling and, and we really don't. And I've always thought, oh, I'm such a good listener. I can listen. But it isn't just listening. It really is asking the questions, as she says, that you that you need to find the answers to that they want you to know about as well. So that that's my words of warmth for this first segment. So it's really yeah. exciting. I love that. I, the, the parts of that quote that resonated with you also resonated with me. The idea of knowing you know nothing, I think, it's important to humble ourselves and to know that we can never know the full context for what other people have experienced. I think empathy does involve that a inquiry, like really knowing how to ask questions and be open to other people's experiences and not jumping in and saying, I know the answer to that. I know how that would feel. But to really let that person speak and not judge them, not leap to a conclusion because you would, you know, you think you would know what had been the case in that context. So. I, re I really love this quote. It's very, it's a very warm word to close out on. Yeah, I think all of our cozy listeners are very empathetic. So I, I agree. Appreciate that. And we do have some shout outs for those sad, cozy listeners. Who are we shouting out this week, Jillian? Samantha C. Thank you for becoming our newest patron. This was recorded on St. Patrick's Day. So we're wishing you the luckiest and cozy year ahead. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much for supporting our show. I'm excited for all of the new book club members that we could possibly have. Again, if you're a votive member or higher, you are welcome to attend our live book club recordings where we read a book every month and we come on Zoom live to talk about it together. And then those episodes get published directly to our patrons. So that's the way our listeners can become part of our own show. So it's a really lovely community. And I'm so grateful to our book club members for keeping me reading, you know, Beyond all the Cicero quotes here, we're enjoying such a, an array of literature that we're exploring together. So if you are interested in joining, you can check out our Patreon. We're at patreon.com slash allthingscozy. And let us know what you think about the new segment. Yes. <laughs> hey, maybe give us a few tries because yeah. I really want this to be a, co a cozy dinner. Mint, maybe for works. now, share some words of warmth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let us know what you think about the words of warmth. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So, you know, we, we always like to evolve here. We don't like to stay too stagnant, especially with our segments. We've been kind of in our in our form for a long time. I'm excited to try some new stuff, you know, shake us out of the and try some new things. Yeah. All things evolving. Yes. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we hope you foraged some coziness and some great information from our episode today. As always, you can keep up with us by following us on social media at All Things Cozy Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. And as I said, our Patreon at patreon.com slash allthingscozy. We'll be back in your ears with a brand new episode in just a couple of weeks. Until next time, stay, stay cozy. cozy.